Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to a new Sunday School class on the Doctrine of Scripture. It's actually been a while now since I last taught here in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, earlier in 2023, I was helping to teach the Rock class, River Oaks College and Career, and then this summer I was helping a little bit with the, the Through the Bible class, but uh, I was hard at work this summer in preparation for this Sunday School class, doing a lot of research and reading for it, so I'm really looking forward to this class with y'all uh, starting today. And this class is going to take us all the way through Christmas, so that's our plan. But I do want to start with this question, because you might not know anything about this class other than the title, The Doctrine of Scripture. So let me ask you, what do you think this class is about? What do you think we'll be talking about in a class like this? The origins, basis, and authority of Scripture, okay? All the true precepts of Scripture. Yeah, yeah, we will be doing some discussion on that as well. The canonization process, yes. We will have a, a whole lesson on the topic of canon, at least one lesson, if not more. So there are quite a few topics that fall under the umbrella of the doctrine of Scripture. If you want a general, like, elevator pitch, like, what is this class about, I would say this class on the Doctrine of Scripture is about what the Bible says about itself. What the Bible says about itself. How should we as Christians, and specifically as Reformed Protestants, think about the Bible? How should we treat it? How should we regard it? How does it relate to other authorities? Those are the sorts of questions we'll be dealing with in a class like this. And so that leads to a related question. Why do a class like this? Why would a class like this be necessary? That's right. If you look at the historical origins of you know, our Reformed denominations, like the OPC and the PCA, they were formed largely in response to departures from the traditional view of Scripture within you know, other Presbyterian bodies, uh, specifically related to a denial of the doctrine of inerrancy. So the idea that Scripture is without error in all that it affirms. And so uh, denominations like the OPC and the PCA have, have been founded on the principle of the inerrancy of scriptures. So uh, that is a, a central topic that we will be addressing in this class. And knowing how to defend inerrancy is one of the reasons why we have a class like this. Other thoughts? The role of scripture in the Reformation. So we are, you know, Protestants. We are a Presbyterian denomination. We're within the Reformed tradition, which came out of the Protestant Reformation. When you split from a church, which is what, you know, we did, you know, with Rome, well, they kind of kicked us out, but that's a big deal, right? You can't do that without justification, right? It's sort of like, you know, what does the Bible say about divorce? God hates divorce, but there are sometimes biblical grounds for divorce. It's the same when it comes to church splits as well. God hates church splits, but sometimes they are necessary. But if you want to understand the reasons why it happened, you have to go back to what was being said about Scripture. That is at the heart of what the, what the Protestant Reformation was about. If you understand the debates over Scripture, that explains a lot of the other uh, debates um, that were happening in the Reformation as well. For example, related to the doctrine of justification or uh, the authority of, of the church and so forth. A lot of those other um, doctrines were um, expressions of differing views on scriptural authority. So we have to get that right if we want to understand who we are and why, why we are the way we are. Yeah, you can even see evolution in Luther's thought as well, right? Like, if you read the 95 Theses, which I actually only did, like, a couple of years ago for the first time, they're pretty close to Roman Catholicism. He does have some critiques, right? He does not like the system of indulgences, but he's seeking to reform the church, and he's hoping that the Pope will respond favorably to that. If that had happened, then um, the, the, the stronger position that he takes by the time of the Diet of Worms in 1521, which is, what, four years later, um, that might not have ever happened. We might not have seen the split between the Roman Catholic Church and Protestants. But what happened was, you know, people dug their heels in on both sides. Um, and, and we will talk about, like, what were those reasons? So that will be one of the things we'll discuss in this class. That's right. There is a temptation that we all face to sort of accommodate Scripture to cultural and social trends, right? To adapt the message of Scripture to make it more relevant, more palatable, less offensive. But 
we have to understand what God's word is and what God's word requires of us and hold to that regardless of what the culture around us tells us. And so we need to be firmly grounded in the clear teaching of scripture. And you have to know the truth in order to spot the lies. Very good. Yes. Okay, so uh, yeah, for the sake of the recording, you talked about um, how uh, there are debates over the role of tradition in shaping our interpretation of scripture as opposed to the principle that scripture is self-interpreting. Yes, that gets at the heart of the debate over the perspicuity of Scripture, the clarity of Scripture, and we will have one or two lessons on that topic as well. So you can, hopefully you can see the importance of having a class like this. So we have several weeks lined up for this class, taking us all the way through Christmas break. What are you hoping to get out of this class? This is a somewhat related question. Okay, yeah, to get a firmer grip on how we should understand and approach Scripture. Yeah, that is my hope for all of you for this class, that you'll have greater confidence in Scripture. Yeah, so there are many different interpretations of Scripture, but if we are to be people of the Word and people of the truth, we have to know how to rightly handle the Word of God. So my hope is that with this class, you'll be equipped to do that. So what I want to do with you guys today is just give you a taste of why I believe this class is necessary and um, equip you to have a sense of um, the issues at stake when we come to the doctrine of Scripture. So I'm going to give you a series of quotes here. And I want you to tell me what you think about these quotes. First one goes back to an individual named Alexander Campbell. You guys familiar with um, the restoration movements of the early 19th century? So this would be like Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, the Christian Church, as they called themselves. These were the folks who often would say things like, No creed but Christ. They were trying to restore the true apostolic church. They hated denominations. And so they were trying to return to a, a pure uh, uh, expression of Christianity that had been undefiled by church history and tradition. Well, one of the founders of this restorationist movement, Alexander Campbell, who went on to found the Disciples of Christ, he has these words to say. I have endeavored to read the scriptures as though no one had read them before me. And I am as much on my guard against reading them today through the medium of my own views yesterday or a week ago as I am against being influenced by any foreign name, authority, or system, whatever. What do you guys think about this approach to Scripture? Dangerous. Dangerous? It, yeah, he's reading Scripture in a vacuum. Hopefully you have red flags going off. A lot of people misunderstand the Protestant doctrine of Scripture as if it's just me and my Bible. If I'm reading my Bible in my closet, that is all I need. That's not the Protestant view of Scripture. That is a misinterpretation. That is, that is disconnecting us from the larger church, the Holy Spirit's work throughout church history. There is a role for church tradition, but we have to understand it properly in the context of what God says about the authority of His Word. But this is not it. This is a very individualistic approach to scripture. And this is unique to our American context. You probably know many evangelical Christians today who have this sort of approach to the Bible, right? Unfortunately, it's very widespread in America today. So my goal with this class is to equip you to respond to arguments like this. Like, how would you respond to somebody who approaches scripture in this way? Well, we'll have more to say about that. Let me give you another quote. How many of you know who Karl Barth was? One of the greatest theologians of the 20th century. Now, I don't say he was one of the best, but he was one of the greatest in the sense that he was one of the most influential, most widely read. Uh, he was a Swiss Reformed theologian um, around the time of World War II. And to his credit, you know, he did speak out against the Nazi regime. Um, and so he did have a lot of good things to say, but he was not fully orthodox in his views, particularly on his views on Scripture. He was part of a movement that came to be known as neo-orthodoxy. This was a movement that taught that the Bible contains the Word of God. The Bible reveals the Word of God. The Bible helps us to encounter the Word of God, but the Bible is not the Word of God. Karl Barth believed that the Bible did contain errors within it. He did not affirm the inerrancy of Scripture. And here is a, a, one of his more popular quotes regarding uh, Scripture. And I'm sort of paraphrasing the first part here, but he said, For evangelical Protestants since the 17th century, the Bible became a paper pope. And unlike the living pope in Rome, it was wholly given up into the hands of its interpreters. 
It was no longer a free and spiritual force, but an instrument of human power. You ever heard that expression before, the Bible being treated as a paper pope? Yeah, I've, I've heard it every once in a while, often by like uh, liberal Protestants or progressive Christians who critique, you know, the traditional evangelical Protestant view of Scripture, that we're committing bibliolatry, if you ever heard that expression before, um, the idea that we're elevating Scripture too high. And Karl Barth is arguing that when we do that, we're basically giving up the Bible to the hands of its interpreters. And so, um, in contrast to the Roman Catholic understanding, which sort of like elevates the autonomy of the Pope in interpreting Scripture, Protestants are elevating the autonomy of the individual in interpreting Scripture. Although, honestly, like, I don't know how his approach to Scripture prevents that from happening. How does allowing errors into the Bible help you to safeguard the authority of the Bible? I'm not quite sure that's a consistent position. But this is a pretty widespread view among um, progressive Christians and liberal Protestants today. And so, one of the purposes of this class is to equip you to respond to objections like this, that uh, the Protestants turn the Bible into a paper pope, or that they commit bibliolatry. Here's another quote for you. This one comes from the, Ca the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which says, The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the Church alone. Its authority in this matter is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. This means that the task of interpretation has been entrusted to the bishops in communion with the successor of Peter, the Bishop of Rome. What do you think about this quote? It does show two authorities. And so within the Roman Catholic Church, there is sort of this understanding of a, a, a dual channels of authority, the written word of God and then also sacred tradition. Now, they would acknowledge that they have the, a common source in Jesus Christ, but that that source is mediated to us through these two channels, scripture and oral tradition. And that oral tradition has been infallibly safeguarded through the centuries by the uh, what they would call the magisterium, that is like the, the office of the Pope and the College of Cardinals speaking authoritatively um, through church councils and so forth. So there's a lot to unpack here. There are questions about the role of tradition, the authority of the church, the role of bishops. As you probably know, we don't have bishops in the Presbyterian church. And so there are a lot of questions that this quote raises for us. And this is going to require some more thorough analysis. What should Protestants think about the role of tradition? What should we think about the teaching office of the church? Now, I'm not going to claim that as a pastor, I am certainly not infallible. But do I have any authority as a pastor? Well, yes, but that authority is under the Word of God. And so we have to understand the nature of church authority in relation to the authority of God's Word. That's going to be one of the goals for this class. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church was, I think... This edition was from like the 90s. Nine, yeah, 92 sounds about right. It, there was one section of it that was recently updated by Pope Francis. You might be familiar with the fact that the Roman Catholic Church has recently um, forbidden the death penalty. So they have actually edited the, the catechism on that particular paragraph to, to forbid the death penalty in all circumstances. That's, that's a good question. So there were actually debates in the Middle Ages. Some people held to this view during the Middle Ages. Others held to what would be much closer to the Protestant view, however. This was not codified as the official Catholic position, really, until the Council of Trent. So, Council of Trent is when this was, like, official Catholic dogma. So, this was in the 1540s is when Trent happened. Um, but in the centuries leading up to that, there were debates within the Catholic Church over the nature of tradition and authority. Um, and so, the Protestant position was present even throughout the Middle Ages, um, and going back to the early church, and I would argue it was the earliest position of the church as well. Um, but um, yes, this became Catholic dogma. This view became Catholic dogma at the Council of Trent. And then it was reaffirmed at the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, and um, it's also stated in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There are degrees of authority within the Catholic Church, though. So like a church council like Trent or Vatican II is considered infallible. The Catechism is not considered infallible, though. It is considered authoritative insofar as it faithfully expresses the teaching of these infallible sources, 
but there are, yeah, there are degrees of authority. So there's even debate, for example, over whether or not the Catholic Church's teaching against the death penalty now is infallible. Some dispute that, even within the Catholic Church. All right. I think I have one more quote that I wanted to share with you. How many of you have heard of the book Jesus and John Wayne by Christian Cobus Dume? So this was a book that was published oh, three or four years ago, I want to say. She is a professor of history at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, you can see by, from the subtitle of the book what this book is about. How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. So it's, it's a pretty polemical book. You know what I mean by the word polemical? She, she's in attack mode here, right? She's very critical of the white evangelical church in America. And in the beginning of the book, she um, kind of puts forward her view of biblical interpretation. And here's what she has to say. The Christian scriptures contain stories of a violent warrior God and of a savior who summons followers to care for the least of these. The Bible ends in a bloody battle, but it also entreats believers to act with love, peace, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Contemporary white evangelicalism in America, then, is not the inevitable outworking of biblical literalism, nor is it the only possible interpretation of the historic Christian faith. The history of American Christianity itself is filled with voices of resistance and signs of paths not taken. It, being white uh, evangelicalism in America, is rather a historical and cultural movement forged over time by individuals and organizations with varied motivations, the desire to discern God's will, to bring order to uncertain times, and, for many, to extend their own power. So, she's kind of putting forward her operating principle, her interpretive framework for the course of this book, which covers the history of the evangelical church in America through like, mostly the 20th century up into the present. There are a number of things going on here that are worth pointing out. On, on one level, she, she seems to be espousing something along the lines of what you could call hermeneutical relativism. That sounds like a mouthful, I know. What do you think I mean by that expression, hermeneutical relativism? Hermeneutics is the study or the method for interpreting Scripture. It's very postmodern. And I've actually, so I follow her on Twitter, and she acknowledges that her um, interpretive uh, framework has been influenced by the postmodern philosophers, like particularly Michel Foucault. But also she mentions like the Frankfurt School. Uh, you might remember I taught a whole class on critical theory last year. And so those thinkers have influenced her interpretive framework. So as a hermeneutical relativist, that means she, she does not believe that there are fixed rules of biblical interpretation, right? That, that there is not just one way of interpreting Scripture. And she's, she, she's speaking to that in this quote here, that there are paths not taken when it comes to the expression of Christianity. There are voices of resistance. So there's one approach, which she characterizes as uh, white evangelicalism in America, but there are other approaches to Scripture as well. However, I don't think she's being consistent in her hermeneutical relativism. Because look at the subtitle of her book. White evangelicals corrupted the faith. How can you say something is corrupted unless you have some idea of what the pure faith is? And to define the pure faith, you have to have clear principles for interpreting what that faith is. So I don't think she's being fully consistent. And, and related to that, and this is a point we'll come back to later, Protestants, and specifically Reformed Protestants, also affirm the doctrine of total depravity, right? That depravity exists within every individual's heart, right? Including me as an individual interpreter. So it would be foolish for me to listen only to my own interpretation, right? Recognizing the pervasiveness of depravity should lead me to seek out how has the Spirit worked through other interpreters of Scripture within the body of Christ, and not only in the present, but throughout church history. Now, of course, since every heart is a mixture of sin and sanctification, no voice is going to be infallible, but we should certainly listen to those voices, especially when we see a historic consensus. When you see like a, a unanimous consensus of, of interpreters through church history, that should be an indicator to you that, oh, maybe that really is the Spirit working through these interpreters to help them rightly read the Word of God. That's one of the principles of interpretation we'll come back to. That's right, yeah. So to repeat that for those who didn't hear, 
Many people, they see the effects of postmodern biblical interpretation and they go, that's what happens when we don't have some central interpretive authority. And that is what draws a lot of people to return to traditions like the Roman Catholic Church or Eastern Orthodoxy because they think that there's certainty there. But where both postmoderns and like Roman Catholics, where they, what they have in common is their denial of the clarity of Scripture, the perspicuity of Scripture. If the Word of God is clear in what it teaches, then you don't have interpretive anarchy, like what Dumais is pointing to, and you don't need some centralized interpretive authority to tell you what to believe, because Scripture itself is sufficiently clear to tell you what to believe. Now, there's much more to be unpacked there, but that does sort of give you a taste of where we're heading in this class. That's right. She's saying these other folks, you know, the, the white evangelicals, they're the ones motivated by power. I just care about the truth, right? Like, there's sort of a double standard there. Like, if, if she's analyzing everything through, like, this framework of power, why does that framework not apply to her own motives as well? There's an inconsistency there, I think. And, and to go back to, a, I think, a point that Bill had initially said, you can see she's, use, she's using a racialized framework here, right? She specifically refers to it as white evangelicalism. Does Scripture itself justify that framework, though? A racialized theological framework? I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. According to Scripture, truth has no color. And that, I think, is one of the fundamental problems with this sort of a, approach to Scripture. Whatever is true is true for everyone regardless of your identity, your ethnicity, your race, your gender. Truth is truth. And that is where I think this approach goes wrong. I've talked about that in the previous class on critical theory that I taught last year. That's uploaded on my YouTube channel if you, if you want to check that out. But for now, if, you're, if you want to learn more about that and some of the problems with critical theory, there are some upcoming books that I'd recommend that I was not able to use for my class because they haven't yet been published, but they're coming out soon. One is a book called Critical Dilemma by Neil Shenvey and Pat Sawyer, which looks at the, the, the rise of critical theory within the church in particular and the dangers that it poses. And another one um, is by Monique Dusson and Krista Bontrager, co-authored. Uh, the book is called Walking in Unity, Biblical Answers to Ten Questions on Race and Racism. Um, so they, they work for the Center for Biblical Unity, which I follow regularly, and I, um, I'm a strong supporter of that organization. So those would be some resources I'd recommend to you if you want to learn more about you know, critical theory and, and the, the dangers of that approach. But this is a class on Scripture. So I want to bring us back to this fundamental question. Based on all that we've said and all these quotes that we see um, depart from a Protestant view of Scripture, could you give me like a definition of a Protestant view of Scripture? What do Protestants say about Scripture? Could you give me like a, a, a pithy, like a one sentence, this is what Protestants believe about the Bible? It's infallible. It's the infallible, inerrant Word of God. That is a great definition. One of the solas. One of the solas. That's right. In fact, I was tempted to, also to, to, to almost just call this class Sola Scriptura, because that idea is so central to what this class is about. And so let's go with that definition, Sola Scriptura. If you want to understand this, the Protestant view of the Bible, we can say that Scripture is the only infallible rule for Christian faith and practice. This is the definition that you should walk away with. I'm hoping you remember this definition because we'll be coming back to it. It is so central to all the various features of Scripture that we'll be talking about. We can essentially say that from this definition of Scripture, all the other sub-doctrines of Scripture that we'll be talking about in this class, they're based on this fundamental understanding. Sola Scriptura is at the heart of what we'll be saying in this class. And right away, I need to give a caveat because Sola Scriptura is so often confused with other teachings that are not what the Protestants taught. Have you ever heard of Solo Scriptura before? Solo Scriptura is the individualistic cousin of Sola Scriptura. They're often confused, but they are very different, and they have very different practical consequences. Here's my definition for Solo Scriptura. Scripture is the only rule for Christian faith and practice. What's missing from that definition? Understanding infallibility is going to be so central to so many of the ideas that we'll be talking about in this class. 
what happens when you say that Scripture is the only rule for Christian faith and practice, as opposed to saying it's the only infallible rule? That's Alexander Campbell. He's denying any authority besides Scripture. There's no authority to the church. There's no authority to to tradition. There's no authority outside my interpretation of Scripture. Often, Protestants get, get characterized as believing this. That's not the Protestant view, though. We need to get back to the original Protestant view of sola scriptura and clarify that we do not support this. Sola scriptura is not the Protestant teaching. It's so widespread among contemporary evangelicals, but that is not what the historic Protestants taught. The central question is which authority is infallible, not whether there are other authorities. Protestants gladly acknowledge there are other authorities besides scripture. Your parents were an authority over you. The civil magistrate, the government, is an authority over you. Your pastor has an authority over you. The session has authority over you. But none of those authorities is infallible. All authorities are therefore subordinate to the Word of God, which is the only infallible authority. So that's what we're going to be highlighting in this class. Yeah, JP. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, so think of the role of the Supreme Court. Their job is to interpret the Constitution, but they are under the authority of the Constitution, right? They don't get to decide, contrary to what some activist judges have have said. But yes, they don't get to decide what the Constitution says. They are under the Constitution, even though they do have an authority to interpret it and apply it. That's right. Very good analogy. Okay, so don't go with solo scriptura. Go with sola scriptura, okay? That's going to be like the main takeaway for today's lesson, okay? So, right, and if you go back to chapter one of the Westminster Confession of Faith, it spells that out. You know, the supreme authority, the supreme judge of all controversies is the word of God itself. Um, But it does acknowledge a subordinate ministerial authority to the church in handling, you know, controversies of faith, for example. But the, the supreme authority is scripture alone. That's right. Okay, let me unpack this definition a little bit more. So one of the sources that I've used to prepare for this class is a book called The Shape of Sola Scriptura by Keith Matheson. Have you all ever heard of Keith Matheson before? So he teaches at Reformation Bible College, so he's connected with Ligonier Ministries, R.C. Sproul. Um, He wrote this book 20-something years ago, and this is one of the best books that I've read on the subject of Scripture. I've I've read several books this summer in preparation for this class. Um, If there was one I had to recommend to you, especially if you're dialoguing with like Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox, this is the source that you want. I I haven't yet found somebody who who does a better job of defending Sola Scriptura. There are other really good resources that I'll recommend to you, but if there's one you had to get, I'd probably say this one. But here is his definition of Sola Scriptura, and he emphasizes four parts to it. Often the the part... uh, Three and four get left off of the definition, but we need all four for a complete Protestant understanding of the doctrine of Scripture. So point number one, Scripture is the sole source of revelation. There is not a parallel source of revelation in tradition, for example. All that we need to believe for salvation is contained in Scripture, either explicitly or implicitly, you know, inferred by good and necessary consequence. But it is our sole source of revelation regarding Christian faith and practice. Number two, Scripture is the final authoritative norm of doctrine and practice. There is no parallel authority. There is no, um, there's no other infallible authority. It is, the, it is the only infallible authority. That's why it's the final authoritative norm. But, and this is where the solo scripturaists go wrong, they leave out points three and four. Point three is Scripture is to be interpreted in and by the church. It's not just you and your Bible in your closet, okay? That might be enough to get you saved. It is, that's what Protestants said. But we are not called to be Christians as isolated individuals living on an island. We are called to be connected to the body of Christ. And therefore, we should interpret Scripture in and through and by the church. Um, And that leads to this fourth point, and we're going to come back to this idea a lot in the class. Scripture is to be interpreted according to the rule of faith. The old Latin expression for rule of faith is regula fidei. Who knows what that term means? Any ideas? Have you ever heard this before? You're going to become familiar with it in this class. It's so central. The rule of faith is an expression that was used from the early church 
going all the way back to like church fathers like Irenaeus, who argued that there are parameters for the proper interpretation of the fundamentals of Christian doctrine. Heretics, like back in the early church, the Gnostics would have been an example of, of heretics. They denied the goodness of the physical created world, so they denied the bodily incarnation of Christ. And Irenaeus argued what the Gnostics and other heretical groups lack is a continuity with the church through all ages in their agreement on the essentials of Christian doctrine. So the rule of faith would be that summary of essential Christian doctrine that has been handed down in unbroken continuity throughout all generations since the time of the apostles. So think of like the Apostles' Creed. Think of the Nicene Creed. These are summaries of the essentials of Christian doctrine. And those essentials have been affirmed uh, throughout the ages in church history. And so that is one way of identifying a true church as opposed to a false church. A true church will always hold to that essential deposit of Christian doctrine that has existed historically in unbroken succession through the ages. So, when people accuse Protestants of opening up the door for interpretive anarchy, we can respond saying, no, because there are limits on the proper interpretation of Scripture. Any interpretation of Scripture that goes outside the bounds of what the church has always confessed throughout the ages That's not a legitimate interpretation of Scripture. Okay, so this gives us a safeguard. It gives us guardrails for the proper interpretation of Scripture. So, those four points together give us a full definition of what we mean by sola scriptura. Okay, so, that said, all right, I'm going to give you something to help you remember what this class is going to be about. I've developed an outline for the class. I'm I'm pretty proud of myself for this, if I do say so myself. (laughs) Okay, I wanted to find a way of helping you remember all of the main points that are going to be covered in this class. And I thought, hmm, well, you know, Calvinists have tulip. What if I added another plant to the mix? Okay, so I thought, okay, if we want to understand the Protestant doctrine of Scripture, let's go with spinach. Sufficiency, perspicuity, which is another word for clarity, Inspiration and inerrancy, I'm kind of cheating there because I'm squeezing two eyes together, but they're related, so I think I can get away with that. Necessity, authority, canonicity, and historicity. If you want to know what Protestants believe about the Bible, you have to know what they teach about each of these points. So let me give you a working definition for each of these. This is our class outline, by the way. We're going to spend one or two weeks on each of these points, and that should take us all the way to Christmas. That's my plan. So, let's go through this. Sufficiency. We could say that this is defined as the scriptures contain everything we need for knowledge of salvation and godly living. We don't need any new revelation from heaven. I'm getting this definition from another book that I read in preparation for this class by Kevin DeYoung. The book is called Taking God at His Word. That's another great resource as well. My definition of perspicuity also known as clarity, is the saving message of Jesus Christ is plainly taught in the scriptures and can be understood by all who have ears to hear it. We don't need an official magisterium to tell us what the Bible means. Now, you remember what I said earlier about what the magisterium is. That's like the Roman Catholic view of papal authority. So that's perspicuity. Inspiration is that act whereby the Holy Spirit came upon the authors of scripture, causing them to write exactly what God intended while simultaneously preserving each author's writing style and personality. This supernatural work of the Holy Spirit upon the human authors means that the author's words are God's words, and therefore are reliable, trustworthy, and authoritative. I'm getting that definition of inspiration from Matthew Barrett, who wrote a book called God's Word Alone, another terrific resource that I'd recommend to you. And then Barrett's definition of inerrancy is a little bit uh, more concise. He says, Scripture in its original manuscripts, does not err in all that the biblical authors assert. So that's what we mean by inerrancy. What do we mean by necessity? Well, let's go back to DeYoung. His definition is, general revelation, that is how God reveals himself through creation, is not enough to save us. We cannot know God savingly by means of personal experience and human reason. We need God's word to tell us how to live, who Christ is, and how to be saved. And then we have authority, also coming from Kevin DeYoung. The last word always goes to the word of God. We must never allow the teachings of science, of human experience, or of church councils to take precedence over scripture. 
And then for canonicity, I had to come up with my own definition for this one, but I'll, I'll show you what I mean when we get to this unit, uh, this lesson. Uh, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament are self-authenticating, proving their own divine authority. The church having come to recognize them as such through a gradual, bottom-up historical process. This means that the canon of Scripture was not authoritatively declared by the church, you know, in, in a position of infallible authority telling us what the canon is. The canon proves itself, and it was recognized as such um, by the church through this gradual process that all Christians recognized over time. So there was no official magisterium that was necessary to declare what the canon of Scripture was. So I'm going to defend that understanding of the canon when we get to this lesson. That's R.C. Sproul's definition. Yeah, R.C. Sproul was the one who said that the canon is a fallible collection of infallible books. Uh, that is, we, we don't have infallible authority to declare what the canon is, but we receive it. Uh, in the same way, think of like, here's an analogy that I've heard. Think of like um, when John the Baptist declared that, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? He is a fallible voice. But he is speaking to an infallible authority, Christ himself. That's what we do when we declare the canonicity of Scripture, too. We, we don't have an infallible authority to, to, to declare it as such, but we receive it being an, uh, the Scripture itself being the infallible authority. Yeah, so when I use, I should have defined that earlier on. When I say infallible versus fallible, I mean the, the capacity to make a mistake, the, the capacity to err. So infallible means incapable of error. Um, and so in, in this case, we would say that the church is capable of error, but can nevertheless receive Scripture as the authority that is not capable of error, because it's the Word of God. And we're going to come back to that idea when we get to the unit on inerrancy. But yes, it is possible to have a statement or a document that is inerrant, but not infallible. You could have like an inerrant phone book, for example, if all the phone numbers are right. But that doesn't make it infallible, because the authors that wrote that phone book are still, at least in principle, capable of making a mistake, even if they happen to not make a mistake in that particular publication. Right. So, yeah, we'll, we'll split those hairs later on, though. And then the last one I have is historicity. De Young defines it as, the most important claims of Christianity are historical claims, and on the facts of history, the Christian religion must stand or fall. Okay? So this is our summary of the class. Just remember spinach, okay? Um, if you've got to take away one thing from this class, well, our definition of sola scriptura, that's important too. But also take away spinach, okay? Hopefully you can remember that. So that way, if anybody asks you later, hey, what did you guys talk about in Sunday school class today? You can tell them this. Okay, now, the purpose of all this is to equip you to answer the critics of the Protestant doctrine of scripture, the Protestant view of sola scriptura. So we're going to be responding to the claims of Roman Catholics who would say that the magisterium is, a in, is an infallible authority that is necessary for the proper interpretation of Scripture. Eastern Orthodoxy doesn't believe that infallibility resides in, in the office of the Pope, but they do believe in the infallibility of um, the church fathers whenever they speak in consensus through like a church council, for example. So they also believe that there are additional infallible authorities. Uh, we're also going to be responding to the critics of modernists. Those would be the children of the Enlightenment, those who believe that science and reason are the sole sources of authority, and that the Bible is a historically unreliable source because it's a mixture of myths and legends and therefore cannot be trusted as the full truth. Postmodernists would be those who deny the possibility of truth altogether. They would say, maybe there's a truth out there, but we can never know it because we are always, as human beings, conditioned by our social environment. And so any truth claim is really just about an exercise of power. It's just a, a power play and word games. We're also going to be responding to fellow evangelicals um, who fall for the trap of solo scriptura. So I want to protect you guys from falling into that trap as well and equip you to distinguish between sola scriptura and solo scriptura. So those are going to be the, the um, topics we'll be covering. These are the sources that I've used for the class. Um, I've already mentioned Keith Matheson's book, The Shape of Sola Scriptura. That's probably the one resource I'd recommend to you. Um, especially if you're in conversations with Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. But Matthew Barrett's book, God's Word Alone, is another terrific resource. Um, another resource by B.B. Warfield, who was a professor at Princeton Seminary over 100 years ago. He's the guy who made the word inerrancy popular. I don't think he invented the word, but he's the one who made it cool. And so um, his book, The Inspiration and Authority of the Bible, is a collection of essays 
um, brilliantly written, and I'm going to be um, gleaning from his essays for the purpose of this class. There's another book uh, by John Mead and Peter Gurry called Scribes and Scripture. They look at the transmission of the biblical text, they look at the canonization process, and they look at the process of translating the Bible into the English language. I just read that book this summer. It's another very good resource. Kevin DeYoung's is the shortest of all these books, so if you're just looking for like a, a concise introduction to the Protestant doctrine of Scripture, that's the one that I'd recommend to you. And then, if you really want to go deep, if you really want to fight with the heavyweights, go with Francis Turretin. He's one of my favorite theologians of all time, no joke. Um, he, was right, he was a contemporary of the Westminster Assembly, I believe, roughly the same time. He was a theologian in Geneva, and he wrote a volume called the Institutes of Elenctic Theology, where he was trying to codify the Reformed view on various doctrines in contrast to the Catholic view, the Arminian view, uh, the Anabaptist view, and so on and so forth. Um, he engages directly with the leading Catholic thought of the time. Um, he's a brilliant resource, um, but he's kind of hard to read, so you got to be ambitious if you want to read Turretin. But I'm going to try to make him a little bit more digestible for you guys. So that's where we're heading for the class. One other resource I want to recommend to you. There's a friend of mine named Gavin Ortland. We both graduated from Covenant Theological Seminary. He's now a Baptist pastor in Ojai, California. He has a YouTube channel called Truth Unites, and he's been doing more work than anyone else I know engaging with um, Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and defending Protestantism. He has a wealth of resources um, on his YouTube channel. He's, he's um, produced like, these are short videos, like 30 minutes a piece, responding to various points of, of Protestant doctrine. Um, so he will present like the Protestant doctrine of Scripture in addition to other points of controversy between the different Christian traditions. So um, that's another resource I'd highly recommend to you. Truth Unites is the name of the channel. His name is Gavin Ortland. All right, we're just about out of time here, but are there any final questions? We covered a lot of ground today, but... So, that's a good point, Brad. Where is, the, where is there a place for common sense? What's the role of common sense? Well, Christians and Protestants have historically said that's what we mean by general revelation. You know, God has made us in His image. He's given us minds to think, and we are capable of reasoning. And so, we should exercise that gift... Um, as God has given it to us, and according to God's design, and that is also a guardrail on proper interpretation. So an interpretation that contradicts the teaching of Scripture, we can rule out right away, um, because it's unreasonable. So there, there is a proper place for common sense as well. We'll get back to that point as well. All right. Can I pray for us, and then we can get ready to head over to the sanctuary for corporate worship? Father God, we do thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you that uh, it is a lamp to our feet, and a light to our path. We thank you, Lord, that um, you have guided us by your truth and by your word so that we can know your will and live and act accordingly. We do pray, Lord, that you would bless this class, that you would use it as a means of equipping us to faithfully hold fast to your word and to defend it against misunderstandings and errors. And we do pray, Lord, for your blessing upon this church and upon our time together as we come together to glorify your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.